end and if they have a question that they, they may not remember at the end because that happens to me all the time uh, just type it in the bottom and we'll uh, we'll catch it through the chat and I'll ask that question back to the group if there are any but um, it, it should be straightforward it's uh, it's a presentation about some of the adventures that we've had um, as, as crew of HMS Psyche but they're not necessarily adventures on Psyche I'll I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, I, I brought Rory, Tassanier, and uh, Glenn and Hobby here to, to give us uh, some different adventures, something not necessarily psyche related, something uh, from their, their experience that I think um, brings a lot of value to what we do with HMS Psyche and speaks to some of the, um, the maritime heritage aspects that we try to bring. Into, uh, into the Yacht Club and through our society. So again, I've got, uh, my name's Ryan Moore, by the way. I'm, uh, I'm a director of HMS Psyche, Canadian Maritime Heritage Society. And uh, with me is, is Glenn and Hobie and Rory Tassonier. And uh, again, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to give you a little bit of, uh, of adventure today. The, the sea has always been a source of intrigue and adventure. The first written tale that I can think of is, is Homer's Odyssey, which is a quintessential maritime adventure. The sea, the sea still has this draw on us today. It can evoke uh, the great era of tall ships. It can bring us back to a simpler time, or it can bring us challenges which help us grow. I'm sure you all join PCYT because you're drawn to the water, whether for fun, camaraderie, competition, or challenge. The inherent lure of the sea is that it is like us, constant yet fickle, enduring yet fleeting, and both beautiful and deadly. So let's sit back and enjoy three nautical adventures. I'm going to start with Rory so that he can uh, uh, give us his, uh, his presentation. So Rory, um, unmute yourself and go ahead. All right. Good evening, everyone. So uh, today I'm just going to be going over some of my uh, tall ship sailing experiences that I've had on the Great Lakes, uh, mainly Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Uh, so the first instance uh, that I ever got the chance to sail on a tall ship was in 2010 and it was during one of the around the time of the tall ship festivals uh, that happened in Toronto the Red Path waterfront festivals and stuff uh, and the ship Bounty uh, was sailing from Rochester New York to Toronto so and they were they were taking aboard a few passengers uh, you can see an image of uh, Bounty here uh, so just some basic specs for it. Uh, so it is a reproduction of the 1787 Royal Navy ship HMS Bounty. Uh, it was built on a larger scale though because it was built in the 1960s in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia uh, for a film production. Uh, it was the 1962 production of Mutiny on the Bounty. Uh, that was on with Marlon Brando. Uh, so it's quite a large ship and it's appeared in, you know, several films uh, since then. Uh, so it's about 180 feet long, um, including the bowsprit. Uh, and it has about a 31 foot beam, approximately. Uh, so it's quite a large ship. It's got three masts, as you can see. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was a really exciting experience. Uh, so the first thing uh, that we did when we got on board is we got settled into our quarters and the quarters were probably the most luxurious quarters you will ever see on board a tall ship because uh, all of the crew were actually because it was a small enough crew we were all able to sleep in the uh, officers cabins uh, which were sort of small one or two bunk uh, cubbies essentially uh, and they were great you had beds and everything uh, the one issue with the living quarters was that they were absolutely riddled with cockroaches. So you had, in the middle of the night, cockroaches crawling all over you. So that was, you know, 
an exciting first experience. Um, so we sailed across Lake Ontario through the night. And during that night, uh, a massive thunderstorm hit. So being the, you know, significantly uh, the tallest thing out in the middle of the lake uh, was a little concerning with lightning uh, flashing overhead and thunder booming around you. But we, we made it through and we got thoroughly drenched, but we made it through. Uh, and we were able to sail into Toronto the next day. Uh, we sort of sailed around the islands for a little bit, waiting for the harbor to open up. Uh, but we managed to get in uh, and coincidentally, that was the exact time that the G20 summit was happening in Toronto. So as soon as we docked, we had about six RCMP officers immediately step on board and they began to do a full inspection of the various armaments of the ship uh, to make sure they couldn't be used against, you know, the delegations that were there. Uh, so HMS Bounty did have, I believe it has four small three pounder cannons. Uh, so the police were very concerned about those. Uh, then they were also concerned about the uh, capstan timbers, which are essentially just big four by fours that you use to turn the large capstan winch, which is typically used for the anchor or other heavy lifting pieces. Uh, but the strange thing is that they weren't concerned about the knives that were on the belts of every single sailor on board that ship. So sort of, sort of a strange experience. Um, so that was my first taste of tall ship sailing. I instantly fell in love, despite all of the crazy conditions. Uh, and uh, yeah, so here's an image of the guest, uh, or, or really the cabins that were on board where we slept. Uh, they weren't very large. Um, so then, later in 2012, I got the opportunity to sign up as a trainee on board the sail training vessel, sail training vessel Pathfinder. Um, if you want to skip back, Ryan, just, just one image. Uh, so it was sailing from Kingston to the final destination was uh, Windsor, Ontario, but we made a few stops along the way. Uh, so the first stop we did, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, was on uh, Maine Duck Island. Uh, it's a very unpopulated island. It really just has a lighthouse and a lighthouse keeper's cottage and things. And it's, it's not really in use anymore now that lighthouses are automated. We had a short stop in Coburg, Ontario, one night in Toronto, and then we were sailing down to Niagara-on-the-Lake for the War of 1812 Bicentennial that year. Um, so just some basic specs of STV Pathfinder. It was built in Kingston. It has a brigantine sail plan, which means it's mostly, it's a two-masted ship, mostly four and a half sails, like you can imagine a schooner, with the exception of two square sails on the forward mast. Uh, it's about 72 feet long, uh, sparred, so including the bowsprit, uh, and it has about a 15-foot beam. Uh, so. The first instance on Maine Duck Island, we sailed out of Kingston uh, and we, uh, this is also a simplified map. There was a lot more tacking involved uh, and, you know, puttering around. Um, so when we arrived at Maine Duck Island, we were getting there close to sunset. Um, so Ryan, if you just want to hit next on the images, great. So this was, this was the sunset that happened at uh, Main Duck Island, we dropped anchor in this sort of sheltered bay in front of a nice, lovely stone beach. Uh, and the plan that evening was to land on the beach, row everyone ashore in the small uh, dory we had, which was probably about 12 feet long. Uh, and we were going to have a bonfire, and you know, we had a book of a few sea shanties and sea ballads that we wanted to sing, and then we'd have a good time, and then we'd uh, row back to the ship and spend the night there and sail off the next morning. Uh, so because it was my watch, uh, typically watches were set up on these ships so that you have the minimum number of crew to sail uh, on deck at all times. Uh, so you got split into three watches and you took different um, four hour long shifts. Uh, so uh, my watch uh, was the current one. Uh, so we were the last ones off the ship, uh, and we rowed ashore to the beach. It was a lovely evening, 
uh, the rest of the crew had already gotten the bonfire set up and lit and they were all hanging out having a chat. So we were able to spend about 10 or 15 minutes uh, on the beach before all of a sudden the winds really picked up and there was a mad dash to get back uh, to Pathfinder. And we, because we were the active watch on duty, we were the first boat. We were the first people back uh, in the boat. So considering that we were the first ones back, at that point, we already had about four foot swells. And, you know, the Pathfinder was maybe 20 yards off the shore. And we were really concerned that our boat was going to swamp because uh, we were just taking waves, you know, head on at least. But it was a, it was a close run thing. Uh, it was already dark at this point. So we, were, we really only had flashlights to guide us back to the ship. Uh, then as soon as we got on deck, we were instantly told to uh, get aloft because as soon as everyone was on board, we were weighing anchor instantly because we were concerned that the squall was going to be pushing us into the island and we'd run aground. So instantly we got our, our rain gear on and we went aloft to start unfurling sails so they'd be ready to be loosed at any point or you know, as, soon as, as soon as the anchor was home. Uh, so climbing up aloft, probably about 30 feet in the air, 40 feet in the air, in the dark with a massive windstorm going and rain, we only had the light from the teeny little weak halogen lamp at the top of the mast uh, to see. So we were sort of fumbling around in the dark for a bit, uh, but it was definitely one of those experiences that really brought us together as a crew because it was one of those emergency situations that every sailor has had at some point. Uh, after that, we managed to sail ahead of the squall so we didn't get uh, caught out in too much more rain. Uh, but we had strong winds the whole way. Uh, we stopped in Coburg for an evening and then we sailed on to Toronto. Uh, from Toronto, we uh, docked and we took aboard a few reenactors as well as um, various uh, period flags and things. Yeah, so there's an image of us being up aloft. That's about how high it was. But imagine that in the dark and the wind and the rain. Uh, so we sailed out one morning from Toronto and we were sailing in a convoy of four to five other tall ships as well as a few smaller uh, modern craft that people were following us in. And uh, we had the English colors flying, uh, period correct for the War of 1812. And we formed, essentially, we sailed in, in formation as a convoy straight across the lake, sailed into the mouth of the Niagara River and dropped anchor and uh, furled up our sails. And it was in the middle of the battle reenactment that was going on. So there was cannons going off, there were muskets going off. We were, you know, it was pretty relaxed on board ship. Uh, we just sort of hung out and watched the battle unfold from the water. Uh, but that was sort of my first experience of, you know, 1812 reenacting, which is what HMS Psyche does, and the experience of being in a historical fleet and doing that sort of historical traditional sailing skill uh, and formation and strategy and those types of things. Uh, so just being able to look out when I was up aloft and seeing the little white sails of the rest of the ships in our convoy or here at anchor when we could just look out and see all of the ships, some of them had cannons that they were able to fire off. Otherwise they had reenactors aboard that had muskets and other personal firearms that they were able to fire off. Uh, and it was a just a really powerful and emotional experience because you felt like you were there. Uh, yeah, so this is this is the sister ship to uh, Pathfinder, that's Playfair, built to pretty much the same specs. Uh, and then we moved on, uh, sailing, well, passing up the Welland Canal, I suppose south, south down the Welland Canal. Uh, so here we are prepping uh, to enter it. Welland Canal was, you know, a very cool experience, but unfortunately I got 
heat exhaustion and was feeling extremely crappy and, uh, you know, occasionally throwing up. So I don't really remember much of it. There's not many pictures once we get into the canal. Uh, so yeah, this is us getting ready because we have to prep all of our mooring lines. I'm not sure if any of you have gone through the Welland Canal, but it's quite impressive the amount of water it moves uh, and just the, the seriousness of the situation because you do not want to uh, crash into anything. So we ended up motoring through this actually. Uh, so then we entered Lake Erie uh, and essentially this is what our sail in Lake Erie looked like with a few more tacking, but it was essentially a straight run to Windsor. But before we were able to head to Windsor, uh, we actually had to sail up the Grand River to Dunville, Ontario. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have been there because unfortunately one of the other trainees on our crew uh, did not drink from the drinking water system. He drank from the uh, head water system, which is just lake water. He became violently ill and we had to kedge him up to Dunville so he could be picked up and then taken to a doctor. Uh, he did not rejoin our crew. But tacking up the uh, Grand River was the most amazing experience. Uh, you are on a 72 foot boat, ship really. And you were tacking, we're, we were heading north, and the wind was, of course, blowing to the south. So we had to tack across this maybe a hundred foot river in a 72 foot boat uh, all the way up. We ran aground, I think I lost track of how many times we ran aground, uh, but we were able to kedge ourselves off of the banks. Uh, if anyone does not know what kedging is, uh, the process is essentially you load an anchor into a smaller boat, you drop it off uh, or further ahead of your ship or you know, the opposite direction of where you're stuck. And once that anchor is secure, you haul yourself and your ship off of the land using that one anchor and that one line. Uh, we had no uh, mechanical winches or electric winches. We just had manpower. It was just a whole bunch of teenagers on a single line hauling a 72 foot tall ship off of a bank. Uh, our captain was very traditional. He did not want to motor up, so we tacked up the whole river. Uh, and it was amazing to see two officers in the tiny dory with a giant anchor rowing it out and dropping it in You know, every 20 minutes or so. <laughs> After a certain point, they didn't bother returning to the ship they just stayed out in the boat, ready to receive the anchor. Uh, yeah, that really, it was one of those really strong team building exercises that, you know, it's just you and the boat and the water and you have to work as a team or you're trapped essentially. Uh, these are just a few images of what it was like on Lake Erie. Uh, the, Sailing on Lake Ontario because it's a very deep lake was very calm the whole way and you didn't feel it at all. As soon as we got onto Lake Erie, which is a much shallower lake, we had six to eight foot swells the whole way. Not many storms, but just a lot of wind. So we spent the entire, uh, I think, week at that point healed over on at least a 20 degree heel. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was shocking. Uh, yeah, so that is my presentation on Tall Ships on the Great Lakes. That was great, thanks Rory. I, I was on uh, St. Lawrence too, which is the sister ship to this vessel, and all of the imagery is exactly the same as I remember on the St. Lawrence too. And I remember Maine Duck Island, and I remember kedging off of that, so. Yeah, oh uh, boy. Oh, well, I'm glad we never had to kedge off of that. <laughs> it seems the three, the three sister ships um, all mm -hmm. kind of have the same uh, pathos when it comes to, um, traditional ways of, of getting yourself out of trouble yeah so um I, i'm just going to talk for a little bit here about uh, hms psyche and, and the boat work that we do um hms psyche is is actually just a reproduction long boat that would be used to get uh, crew or stores from from the larger ship 
up to uh, up to shore or up river, it's um, it's sort of a launch from a larger vessel. And uh, it, right now, it it's a 22 foot long boat. It's it's based on Admiralty plans from 1776. It has two masts, four oars, and a motor. And uh, certainly, we we make use of the oars. It has no keel, it has no winches, it's just good old fashioned muscle power and determination. For me, it's an exercise in getting back to the roots of sailing. Uh, it's an open hull, so you're close to the water and you can hear the, the water sluice by as the, as the boat moves forward. You can feel the power of the wind as you control the sheets with your hands. It connects me to the intrepid spirit of our predecessors who faced the elements with the simplest of technology. This kind of boating is pure adventure for me. Our biggest challenges, of course, with a boat like this have been uh, wind and wave. We don't have a keel, we don't have a lot of ballast, so um, we tend to experience a lot of leeway in a boat like this. And it's, uh, it does tend to make things a little bit harder uh, in terms of trying to sail up wind or, or uh, on a, a close hull. But, we're we're working on some improvements to to make the boat more efficient a more efficient sailor. Everyone makes fun of me. They say I took a rowboat and tried to turn it into a sailboat, but uh, I like to think it started as a sailboat and I just made it better. So the improvements you may have seen in the yard in, in the last couple of weeks, we've updated the paint job, uh, we've refreshed a lot of the uh, masts and spars, we've replaced all of the rigging with hempex, which is a synthetic material, but it looks like the original rope from, from 200 years ago and uh, this winter we'll be initiating a new project to replace the sails with a lug rig and now this is uh, what's called a spritsail rig and it's, um, it's a, a purpose, uh, an angled piece of, of spar that runs uh, on a 45 degree angle from the mast to spread the sail and, and what we'll do is we'll run a more traditional lug sail on that. So what do you do with a boat like this? Well, we, we take it out on the lake and, and we actually use it to get around and, and to learn how to sail and, and have some fun and, and challenge ourselves, of course. Our first season was, was really difficult in that um, there was very little wind and very high waves when there was wind. This was 2018. We had a heck of a time and everyone thought I was cursed. At least I thought I was cursed bringing this kind of weather. Um, Psyche being an open boat needs medium winds with calm sails, which we don't often get, or calm seas, we don't often get in Lake Ontario. Well, in 2019, we got our break and the weather has, has been a lot more cooperative since then for us. Uh, we've had some great cruises. This is a, a picture of uh, from far away on the shore, looking at Psyche on the left and another boat we call HMS Ferret. Uh, which joined us on a little trip out to uh, Snug Harbor. So we sailed from, from Port Credit to Snug Harbor. Relatively simple sail for a modern boat, but uh, fraught with challenges for us because uh, we were still learning how to sail this particular rig. We had some people on board that uh, got seasick and uh, we lost a hat overboard, which was, uh, um, you know, hor horrendous. But um, anyways, we made it into Snug Harbor and, and set up and we got, a, we got a lot of uh, funny looks and a lot of questions when we got there. We had a great lunch with the crew of the Ferret. And then we turned around to head back to Fort Credit and uh, Psyche was leading the, the two vessels out, out of um, Fort Credit. And all of a sudden I start seeing these splashes around me. And I look back and Ferret is, they've got this potato cannon and they're firing this potato cannon. They're firing potatoes at me. Uh, they never hit any of us. They never hit the boat. But, uh, you know, if, if, if you want some adventure, try being shot at with potatoes. Uh, we had to leave half of our crew behind at Port Credit because they got seasick and didn't want to make the trip home. So I was left with some uh, rather rock recruits and uh, had to bring them back safely. So I managed to uh, teach them the, the ropes really quickly. And uh, off we went back to Port Credit. Uh, later that season, we uh, visited the Fanshawe Reservoir. Fanshawe Pioneer Village is a little um, collection of log cabins and old houses that they put together in a conservation area uh, that is surrounded by the reservoir created by a large dam. 
Uh, it turns out that this this uh, reservoir is is big enough to do some sailing on for Psyche. It's about three kilometers uh, from north to south, and about 500 meters in width at its widest point. And we we managed to put the boat in and actually get some really decent sailing there. It's uh, um, you got to cross the dam to get there, and then you got to drive down this really steep ramp to put the boat in. But once it was in, we were all set. And uh, we were doing some reenactments there. Here we're landing some British redcoats to go fight the Yankees uh, within the village. So uh, we get a little bit of excitement in that regard. We fought the battles with, uh, with some other vessels. And of course, we landed the troops. And, and later that evening, we went back out, just, just the crew of the Psyche. And we had a little quiet sail to ourselves around sunset. And that's probably the best sail that we've had to date, where we had some very good winds. Uh, to the point where we actually had to ease the sheets quite a bit. We don't have reef points. We don't have uh, any way to decrease the sail area. Once the sail is up, it's up. That's it. So uh, we can either take down the sail or we can ease the sheets. But uh, other than that, we can't take any wind out of our sails. And that's and that's how we manage. And we, have, we we got a really good sail out in this little tiny reservoir out by London. And... Uh, the last adventure from 2019 was our little cruise to Toronto Harbor. I, I did something crazy and I got my Toronto Harbor license and uh, decided, hey, let's go out there and, and see what we can do. So we uh, launched from Humber Bay and, and motored across. It was ridiculously hot, stinking hot, no wind, and uh, made it up to the Western Gap. And by then the wind had started to kick, kick up. Some other boats were coming out. We had to navigate that. We had to navigate the ferry going across the airport, but uh, finally made it into the harbor and, and had a little bit of a good sail inside there. But uh, I think we lost our main sprit yard at some point. It, uh, uh, it got loose. There's a, something called a snotter that holds it to the mast and that leak that holds the snotter broke. So the mast projected forward and, or the yard projected forward and uh, we lost that sail. So we, uh, we brailed up and, and headed over to Hanlon's Island put in for a little bit and, and had, had our lunch, uh, a nice little picnic there on Hanlon's. And then uh, Jerry rigged the yard back to the mast and then rode around the um, little riv rivers between the islands for a bit, singing sea chant shanties. We visited the uh, Gibraltar Lighthouse, which was built in 1803. And then we rode out uh, back to the, the main harbor and sailed a bit and heading back through the Western Gap to um, to Humber Bay. So all in all, uh, these adventures required a lot of skill, a lot of teamwork, and um, a lot of fun, I think, a lot of creativity that we got out of it. So again, connecting to uh, the older uh, methods of sailing and, and being able to uh, jerry-rig something up if something goes wrong, just based on our readings of, of um, documents and logs and descriptors from that time period, we were able to uh, replicate some of the solutions to some of the problems that we replicated. <laughs> but all in all, these, these adventures make me feel connected to the old salts that used to sail the Great Lakes in schooners and barks. Some people go to far off places for a vacation. Me, I go back in time. I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Glendon here and see if we can get him going. He's got a a really interesting and, and much more uh, modern adventure for us. Okay, thanks, Ryan. That was really good. Um, don't oversell me by saying it's interesting, okay? <laughs> Everybody hear me all right? Yeah? Okay. Um, my experience is going to be a little different from... Uh, the two previous ones. Um, it involves sailing, but not really. It's sailing on a destroyer from the Royal Canadian Navy. That one there, HMCS Yukon. Uh, it was old then, <laughs> probably as old as I am now, but uh, a nice vessel. It was called one of the Greyhounds of the fleet because of those absolutely beautiful lines on it, uh, made for shedding water and shedding ice and for washdown during uh, radioactive contamination drills. But enough about that. Let me tell you a bit about the cruise. 
um, started in Halifax. Actually, Ryan, if you want to, thank you. Started off in Halifax and uh, we cruised south. We first stopped in Freeport where we almost blew up while refueling, but it didn't happen. Uh, we carried on then to Nassau where uh, we took a tour that wasn't supposed to be free, but it ended up being free because the guy that took us didn't ask us if we had any money and we didn't. He was annoyed. Um, from then, we went to uh, Panama. And this is the part that I'm going to talk about the most. Um, when we first arrived on the Atlantic side of the canal, uh, we anchored just off Port Colon. It was early in the afternoon. See, up here, it's counterintuitive because you think it's down there, but it's not. Uh, it was, oh, warm, sticky. Your clothes were stuck to you. There was no escape at all. But because we're tough, we uh, set anchor and we waited our turn. Later on in the evening, uh, we uh, motored our way up to the first lock and we were hooked up to something called mules. Now, if you don't know what a mule is, it isn't one of these things. It's like a little double ended locomotive. And each side of the vessel ties on one on this side, one on that side and they pull you through and you just have to maintain steerage. They'll give you the way so you can maintain steerage, but it's very slow. It's very deliberate. As you can imagine, it has to be. Well, uh, by the time we reached Lake Gatun, it was dark. I hear it's really, really gorgeous. I saw none of it, but yeah, it's all right. Now that evening, my father and I were working on a, oddly enough, a musket that he had recovered during one of his diving expeditions with the Navy. Um, it was down on the Chiefs and POs mess where I really had no business being. So I went up onto the bridge and uh, the lights were down low, of course, because we were navigating. And I thought, okay, I gotta go look at this for what I can see, because looking out, all you could see is the bow light and the reflected light out of the bridge. That was it. So I stopped and stepped out on my usual perch, the starboard lookout. And from there, I passed into a different world that was completely unfamiliar to me. And it, was, it, it well, let's see. Um, the rattle and hum of the ship it subsided in, into the silence as the sounds of the jungle, which we were very near, sort of made their way across the surface of the lake. Now, a boy from the Maritimes doesn't get to hear jungle sounds very often. And they're completely foreign. The only way you would have heard them is on Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom on TV. And the other thing, smell is supposed to be one of the strongest senses. You could smell the foliage that had been cooked throughout the entire day coming at you, wafting its way across the lake. And the blackness was all encompassing. There was only our little shadows. We were a spot of light on a big dark lake. In the distance, of course, you could see other ships and their lights twinkling, but it, it's like they were in another world. They were like stars, that accessible, that remote. There was, you knew you weren't alone, but you felt alone. We were a solitary ship sailing through the darkness. Um, after standing out there for about 20 minutes and just taking it all in, because I knew this was gonna be a once in a lifetime experience, all of a sudden I felt a, a sweat arise on me. I don't like sweating too much because I do it too often. So I went back inside seeking non-existent relief. Uh, you see, Yukon wasn't air conditioned. And that was a problem. Eventually, I made my way back to my bunk. Underneath the anti-submarine mortars, there were six of them and you always banged your head on the barrel of one. And then down below, and as it was going through, the smell of diesel, paint, and cooking grease pushed their way up my nose. 
and the screws churning underneath my mess, mess number 12, replaced the sound of the land and the jungle off in the distance. I'm not sure when we made Balboa on the next day. We stayed for a couple days, but you know, aboard ship, the hours pass differently than they do on land. And after a couple days, well, we said we completed our trip. If you could bring up the, the map again, Ryan. The North American. Yeah. We completed our trip and uh, we stopped over in Mazatlan, which was the creepiest, filthiest, most disturbing, criminally ridden place that I have ever been in my entire almost 60 years now, you were afraid to walk the streets. Uh, unless you were looking for particular things and then, well, it was open for business. I was 12, I wasn't open for anything. <laughs> and then we went up to San Diego and we went to Disneyland. That was the big thing about San Diego. That and it was hot and it looked very California. And from there, we took the last leg of our trip and we pulled into a squamal, docked there. And that was the purpose of our journey to take Yukon from the East Coast to the West Coast, where she's going to be set up as a training vessel. Um, the funny thing about San Diego, a few years ago, 20 something or other, Yukon made her way back to San Diego under tow. She was shot through with holes, cleaned, and sunk as an artificial reef. I found that kind of ironic because, eh, you know, I don't, things like that, they bother me somehow. I mean, I know it's going to get turned into razor blades if it doesn't become a reef or something like that, but still, that was my vessel. And the first one that really introduced me to what it was like to go to sea. Um, once we hit a squamalt the next day, I flew back to Nova Scotia. I still felt the sea underneath me. And it's kind of been that way ever since. Thank you. Thanks, Lennon. That was fantastic. Um, you also have your little. Oh, God. <laughs> that. Yes. My order of the locks with the. The cool chick on one side and the monkey at the helm on the other side, and I think there's some mosquitoes down in the corner. Um, this tells you how old this is. The 16th day of August, 1974. Oh my God. <laughs> so did they hand these to you in a little booth at the end, just like they do the pictures in a roller coaster? Um, no. <laughs> it was mail. Here. Cool. <laughs> Because everybody else had probably done it half a dozen times or they crossed the line and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? In 1974, this was a big deal. And uh, I didn't realize what kind of impact it was going to have until a couple of years later when I joined Sea Cadets. And then now, when I was fortunate enough to be able to sign on with Psyche and put my daughter through Sea Cadets. But there you go. Well, thanks very much, Rory. Thanks very much, Glendon. That was very wonderful. I really appreciated that. I hope everyone uh, um, has some great dreams tonight, some, some great adventures coming this summer. Uh, even with, with COVID in the background, I think that there's still opportunity out there to, to, um, to really get out there and, and seize life by the horns and, and have some fun. So uh, hopefully today's presentation gives you some inspiration and some thoughts in that regard. Uh, and at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. You can either enter them into the chat or you can unmute yourself and, and speak up. Rory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, <I'm disturbing. laughs> um, the bounty that you were on, the one that was made for 62 in Lunenburg, is that mm. the one that went down a couple of years ago? That That is the app. Uh, it went down in 2012. So yeah. um, it went down. Uh, it was in the fall, I think. Yeah, because they sailed out to try to protect themselves from a hurricane, and didn't work. Plan didn't quite work. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate. That was a yeah. Well, they a, only lost a two. big loss. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It was surprising because they actually they built that 
to be burnt at the end of the movie shoot. Yeah. But then uh, it was kept because Marlon Brando thought it would be such a shame if a beautiful ship like that was lost. Yeah. So it, it got an extra, you know, 50 years of its life. So it wasn't the same skipper that took it down that was uh, in charge when you were on, was it? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't the same crew. Uh, yeah. Rory, question How big, how much bigger? Uh, in length and beam was the bounty you sailed on comparing to the original? Uh, what we were told is it was only probably, they probably added about two to three feet extra on all of the dimensions because they, the main reason they built it larger was to accommodate camera crews below decks. So you were actually able to stand full height uh, below decks, which on the original ship you wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Interesting that uh, the the bounty so famous for the mutiny was, um, of course, uh, a huge blemish on the Royal Navy at the time. They actually sent another ship after the mutineers called the Pandora, and uh, they, the Pandora had a box in the stern, uh, which was basically a prison cell. And it was intended to bring those mutineers back for punishment and to make a, a public trial out of it. But what, what ended up happening is the Pandora went out there and they found a few of them. And then they were heading back and they, they, uh, they lost the ship on the Great Barrier Reef. But what's really interesting in the terms of the connection was HMS Psyche started life as uh, HMS Pandora 2. Uh, the original builder had built Psyche as a replica of one of the boats that was put on board the original Pandora. That's where um, he got the plans from. So you can, it's kind of interesting, the, the, I guess the circles that we all go in, in, in the nautical world. All right, well, I don't, I don't see any other questions. <laughs> But uh, thank you all very much.